Hello again to you, Dr. Swan. Hello, Professor Tegan. Oh, I've been promoted this last week, have I? Uh, absolutely. Just I'm in awe. Just oh. in awe. <laughs> you don't get paid anymore. Ah, yeah. I, sh- I knew that there would be a catch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, let's get crackalacking on Coronacast, the show all about the coronavirus and sometimes, like this week, about other nasties as well. I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turable Land. And I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan coming to you from Gadigal Land. So Norman, a little bit of a recap on news from COVID land in the last week or so. And one of the big pieces of news that came through was another study into people with long COVID, this time a cohort of doctors, Obviously, because people who work in healthcare are often working with sick people and sick people in these past few years have often had COVID, healthcare workers have been exposed to COVID at quite high levels, which means that they're actually quite an interesting cohort of people to study about the effects of COVID on human bodies. Particularly in the United Kingdom, where they had so much COVID, particularly in the first year of the pandemic or the first few months of the pandemic. So this is a survey of uh, British doctors. And what it shows in brief is a very significant burden of long-term illness in the people who've had COVID-19. In fact, one of these people was either the chief medical officer or the chief health officer of the UK um, developed long COVID during that first year of the pandemic. So a lot of doctors uh, have been affected and have been describing the symptoms in great detail. So it just shows the, the, the ongoing burden of this. And if there are still doubters, um, doctors should know, I suppose. What does it tell us about long COVID that we didn't already know? Probably not a lot, except to illustrate the burden that people who are suffering from this carry. With, it, with you know, In other words, the survey showed that it was considerable. And what does it mean for the healthcare system? Like, I'm assuming if I'm getting sick, I want to know that if I'm getting to a hospital that the doctors and nurses are all there ready to sort of take care of me. What kind of impact does long COVID have on the ability of the healthcare system to treat sick people? I don't think that's been fully measured. It's implied in this in this survey, but it's not a comprehensive survey of every single doctor or, uh, or healthcare professional in the United Kingdom. So it's hard to know and extrapolate beyond that just what the impact is. But it's known that in hospital environments and aged care environments, you can get significant reductions in staff levels when people are, have got COVID because you do not want to transmit this to patients. And we do have significant rates in some hospitals in Australia of hospital acquired COVID. And as we've said before, the indicative data are that the mortality rate doubles in people who catch COVID in hospital. Because they're already sick, they're already vulnerable. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a more frail, it's a more frail population. So let's talk about some, a virus that isn't COVID today. We talk a lot about COVID and it's the middle of winter, it's virus season. And the sort of the big three are COVID, obviously, influenza, which we also speak a lot about, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. So let's get a bit of a refresher on that today, Norman. Okay, so COVID-19 is... We're going through a lull at the moment. Remember, it comes in waves. The peak of the current wave that we've just been in was in early June with deaths and hospitalizations and case numbers. And case numbers over the last week, the rolling average, have dropped depending on state between 20 and 25 percent, which is good news. We'll get another, we'll get another um, wave coming, but uh, at the moment things are looking okay with COVID-19, uh, at least as far as that goes. With respiratory syncytial virus, um, it's a mixed picture. I'll come to the I'll come I'll come to the data in a minute, but let me explain what respiratory syncytial virus is. So this is a respiratory virus. Most of us have been infected by it by the age of two. Uh, There are two forms of it, A and B, and respiratory syncytial virus A is thought to be much worse for children, um, particularly younger children. So why are we worried about this? Well, for most people who get RSV, it's a mildish cold, um, cough, sneeze, fever. But for some people, uh, it's much worse, and it's particularly much worse when you get it as a baby, uh, certainly the under five age group and in, and in the elderly and in people with immune deficiency, heart disease, lung disease. Um, now, the conditions that children get that are caused by RSV or typically caused by RSV are croup and bronchiolitis. So bronchiolitis is where the, the problem with RSV is that it gets down into the lungs more than other respiratory, many other respiratory viruses. 
And, uh, and when it does, it causes real problems. So, for example, when it gets down into the lungs of young babies, it causes something like bronchiolitis, which is where the baby is struggling to breathe and has a lot of wheezing. And it's very fine-sounding wheezing. And these babies can get into problems, even, even healthy babies. And um, there's, a, you know, there's a significant admission rate to intensive care of young babies and indeed young children with respiratory syncytial virus. Um, because of bronchiolitis. The other, the other condition is called croup, which is also can be caused by RSV. And croup is the opposite of a wheeze. So a wheeze is <laughs> where you're making a noise when the breath is going out. Croup is where you're making a noise on the way in. <laughs> And anybody, they both sound awful. Yeah, and croup goes along with a barking cough, and I'm not good at imitating the cough of croup. But any parent listening to us who's had a baby with croup knows exactly what we're talking about. It can be scary. The, the child can be quite distressed with it. And sometimes it does require hospital admission. In older adults, um, the lower respiratory disease that this causes can end up in intensive care and in death. So it's a serious disease in the elderly, the frail, comorbid, and so on. Um, and the statistics are at the moment, so for example, we had very little RSV during COVID, uh, almost certainly because we were, we were not importing it from overseas and we were distancing from each other and using a lot of uh, hand hygiene and what have you. Um, but last year, the statistics went way up. And part of the reason was for that was that the PCR test that you got for COVID also picked up RSV and influenza. So we were picking up more RSV than we would otherwise. There might have been just as much as RSV around before that, but we, we didn't really know it. And it's relatively recently that RSV has become a notifiable disease so that we measure it. So we had a total of 95,000 reported cases last year or thereabouts of RSV in Australia. This year to date, there's been 74,000, I think, at the last time we looked. And some. Oh, but we're only halfway through. We're only halfway through. It's normally a virus that happens from autumn to midwinter. But the other thing that's happened with RSV globally is that that seasonality has been shifted a little bit. So last year we had a, a latish, uh, it happened later than you would have expected. There's been summer cases of RSV, which is very unusual. Um, this year, it looks as though it's been earlier and more typical of RSV. But some states like South Australia are saying they're seeing a tripling of the number, or sorry, eight times the cases that we would have seen compared to last year. Other states are not necessarily showing an increase. And this is part of the problem with measuring these diseases it depends on whether they're tested for, whether they're notified when they are tested for, although pathology labs do do the notifications. Um, so th th there, are, there are inaccuracies around the data. But the, as you say, the year has got a way to go this year and it may well be worse than last year. So in terms of protection, you mentioned before the sorts of things that we usually use to protect ourselves from respiratory viruses, social distancing, uh, hand hygiene is relevant for RSV, but also... If don't forget masks. <laughs> don't forget masks. But then one of the things that is on the horizon for RSV is vaccines. Yes, and there have been various trials of respiratory syncytial virus vaccines. They've been relatively unsuccessful until fairly recently, but there's um, a relatively new vaccine which has shown significant benefits and, in fact, has been approved in the United States for older adults. So this was a trial in people aged over 60, large trial, 37,000 people, <coughs> looking at whether or not it prevents the complications in the lower respiratory tract, in the lungs. Sound familiar? It's just like COVID. Does it prevent severe disease? Also looking at whether it pre prevents symptomatic disease, acute illness as well. And what they showed was, and this is really just one season, it's, it's not over an extended period of time. So the duration of the um, protection is not fully known yet with these vaccines. But it showed a 60-odd percent, nearly a 70 percent reduction in lower respiratory tract um, disease and about a 60 percent reduction in acute disease. So pretty effective. So just to chime in there, that's actually the Pfizer vaccine that you're talking about. There was another RSV vaccine by Glasgow Smith Klein that showed even higher efficacy. Yeah, but you also want to know whether or not this is going to be effective in the under five age group and, and in pregnant women as well. So those trials are underway and this vaccine is yet to be um, approved in Australia. There's also a monoclonal antibody, again, something that CoronaCast listeners now know well because we had monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19 and there is a monoclonal antibody for 
um, RSV, but uh, that is yet to be approved in Australia as well. But in some places, that's what they're using in very sick children. So we've spoken to infectious diseases um, expert Paul Griffin before, and he's sort of forecast that maybe in time, maybe in the next few years, we might actually have a triple barrel vaccine that would protect us against COVID, influenza and RSV, but that's still a ways off. That's still a ways off. But it turns out that you can be co-vaccinated, just like you can be co-vaccinated COVID-19 with flu, you can be co-vaccinated with RSV and, and influenza as well. So, so it's safe to get them both on the same day? Yeah, should the, when it, well, should it will become available in Australia, just the question is when. And one more question for you, Norman, which I've been thinking to myself ever since I said the mouthful respiratory syncytial virus. Is this another question without notice? <laughs> another. Gives me the shits. But anyway, carry on. And it gives you the syncytial. Uh, what does syncytial mean? So syncytial means when you get a sort of clumping of cells together and the, the syncytium is a bit like a, a spider's web of cells. And if, if like, so the cells come together and they join up. And in RSV... Um, the uh, cells that are infected tend to clump together. So that's the syncytium. Oh, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> I'm glad I had the answer for you. <laughs> no well, no doubt is... microbiologists will write to us telling us what a fool he is. It's not exactly <laughs> that, but I look forward to those questions. Please do send those in. Uh, but that is all we've got time for on Coronacast or RSV Cast as it was today. We'll see you next Wednesday. We'll see you then. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.